All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, first and foremost, thanks, Printed Matter team, for uh, inviting me to have this talk. And thanks, especially, Anna Collins and Eugene Chang for, uh, for, me, for making this happen. My name is Marek Nadjolka. I'm a graphic designer and editor uh, from Prague to Republic. I'm here today to, to present to you and talk a little bit more about a book I, I edited. It's an anthology uh, called National Letters, uh, Languages and Script as Nation Building Tools, which I published in November 2019 together with uh, the Academy of Arts, Architecture, and design in in Prague. Nation letters is simply put about how written languages has forged uh, national identities and nation states. Uh, this talk will be, will be divided into two parts. In the first part, I will give you an introduction to the topic, how I got to the topic, to the team, how to how to how the book was shaped and also why is it important today in these corona times. And the second will be a presentation of uh, four case studies, which make up most of the book uh, with texts and images. When I was preparing for the talk, which should have taken place uh, in New York in, in March, uh, I was going through the version which I presented at Enga uh, Bookshop in Chicago earlier in March. And I realized it's, a, it's impossible not to reflect the previous weeks in this talk. Because we can see now how easily can borders uh, be back in a second. And how easily can the world be divided again into the nation states, isolating themselves from the rest of the world. And next weeks, months, or even, even years will show us how easily or hard it will be to unite again. Uh, so let me first, uh, let me start the first part of this talk with the answer to the question, how I got to this topic and grasp a little bit the terms necessary for understanding the book. Uh, let me now tell you a story which, which shows how languages and writing systems shape our view of the world and how languages are used as a political tool, as almost uh, everything else in the world. Everything can be politicized. And on one example from, from my own country, from Czech Republic. Um, I was born in 1992, the last year of, of the state called back in the days Czechoslovakia, now Czech Republic and other states, Slovakia in Central Europe. In 2018, my country celebrated 100 year anniversary of the establishment. And I never realized before that my country was based on the literal fantasy of the one man, the philosopher and the first like the first Czechoslovak president, Tomáš Garek Masaryk, who had a dream of an independent Czech state. Uh, a chapter of his, one of his important books, or we can call it pamphlet, is in a national letters and provide us uh, a perfect introduction to the mind and rhetoric of a central European politician in power 100 years ago. Uh, thanks to his uh, philosophical education, he's able to articulate and and uh, and write uh, his thoughts without being like without being insulted or aggressive, which is which is quite quite nice and to to, to read it uh, today. Uh, let me quote my text in the book at this point, to give you a full uh, context. Uh, the First World War and the ensuing political situation 
completed a gradual process in which the victorious Allied powers allowed the smaller European nations to fulfill their cultural and political struggle for self-determination, thus dismantling the old system of multinational empires along the linguistic fault lines. Uh, between the years uh, 1914 and 1918, during the First World, uh, First World War, Masaryk traveled around the world to meet and persuade Western politicians to accept his proposal of the completely new state of Czechs and Slovaks. And it is worth mentioning that Czechoslovakia was based on Masaryk's conceptual construct of ethnic Czechoslovakism which joined the Czech and Slovak speaking population into the 8. million national majority, over 3. million German speakers and other smaller minorities, which put together accounted for about a third of the overall population. He made up his fantasy of common ethnic Czechoslovakism just to outvote Germans. Czech and Slovaks didn't have very much in common. They just understood each other because Slovak is, in, is not far from being a dialect or vernacular of Czech and, and vice versa. And these linguistic similarities of Czech and Slovak language gave Masaryk the argumentation platform to push this idea into reality. So this little example from my perspective, from my my landscape just gave you a little bit the introduction to this to this topic of uh, or what uh, nation letters will be about. And the previous story takes me to another piece of the puzzle of how I got to the topic of nation letters. Um, it was summer 2017. I had a I started looking for a, a topic my master thesis at the Academy of Arts, Architecture and Design in Prague. And by chance, I, I bought uh, actually this book. It's a Czech translation of Laurent Binet's uh, book, Seven Function of Language. And it was the first thing, by the way, it doesn't have the most beautiful cover, but anyway, the content is perfect. And it was the first thing, first thing which put me on the right track. I didn't know at the time where the tracks are heading. If you haven't heard about this book, I strongly, I strongly recommend it. It's a detective novel about the death of famous French philosopher uh, Roland Barthes. Uh, the book is written from the perspective of a detective who's solving the crime. And it's also, on the other hand, about language and semiotics. Uh, that's how I got really interested in languages and writing systems. And at the same time, I was asking myself how to deal with it with, from my perspective of a graphic designer. So when I got deeper into the topic of languages and writing systems, I realized that common language and especially its written form was the essential element of a nation building in the previous centuries. Let me, let me quote now a Canadian philosopher, uh, Marshall McLuhan in his uh, Gutenberg Galaxy. It is important nowadays to understand where there cannot be nationalism, why there cannot be nationalism, where there has not first been an experience of vernacular in the printed form. So the invention of printing press established and fixed written languages and their forms, typography, and through this helped to build the image of its own antiquity, which, uh, which is written by another great intellectual, uh, Benedict Anderson in his the most important book, Imagined Communities. Uh, so this is where we begin to observe a sense of the imagined community called a nation. People who think, speak, and 
uh, read the same language. Uh, let, me, let me quote Marshall McLuhan once again. It may well be that print and nationalism are axiological or coordinate, simply because through print, a people sees itself for the first time. The vernacular in appearing in high visual definition affords a glimpse of social unity coextensive with vernacular boundaries. And more people have experienced this visual unity of their own, of their native tongues via the newspaper than through the book. So since this point, I knew I got it. I, I, I solved the puzzle and simply put, I knew that my thesis will be about or was about the languages, writing systems and the nation building with the chief focus on, uh, on the 18th, 19th and 20th century with the overlaps uh, to present, present times. Um, because most of the nation states we are living in today were established during this period of 18, 19, 20th century. And there are still and will be natural framework of our lives and social health and educational systems, despite its relative novelty. And you could have seen it brightly during the last few weeks, how nation states are still the, the essential framework of our, of our uh, world when uh, borders are closed. And in the hand with this, you can see all over the world that somewhere uh, nationalism or isolationist tendencies are on the rise again. So the question is why? And as the British documentary filmmaker, uh, Adam Cardis, the director of uh, Hyper Normalization, a uh, perfect documentary, said in an interview for The Economist that in politics, uh, nationalism is still the most straightforward and easiest narrative for imagining futures. It is effortless to look back than to look into the future, which is in its essence completely uncertain. Um, there is a beautiful diagram in the book Down to Earth by the French philosopher Bruno Latour, showing the previous, showing the previous vector of modernity, which is like a timeline going from, from the point A, which is like a local, this is where we, where we live, to the point B, global, which is like uh, our aim of, of, the, of, the, of our lives to become connected and become global and become one, one planet. And Latter suggests to shift this vector, which goes to global, to the new attractor, which he call terrestrial, something which can be agreed on across the spectrum. At the same time, those who want to, who want to go back to the local, which can be called nationalists, and those who want to benefit from the connected world. And then he suggests, what he suggests is to stop blaming the other sides, take down the wall between these two sides and give them a new narrative where like localism and globalism can work at the same time. And I think his idea is more actual than ever before because he was writing it mostly because of an ecological, uh, in an ecological narrative. Uh, and what I point here is that nationalist tendencies are only a react, uh, a, a uh, not very good reaction to avoid the grand narrative of current times where the future has been canceled. So, but, uh, the answer is not nationalism or nationalist tendencies because uh, there are many challenges 
in the contemporary world, uh, nation states are very much limited in answering the issues which knows no borders such as climate change, migration, and most recently uh, spread of uh, COVID-19. And in an era where when a human civilization needs to collaborate and respond to these issues as a whole, cooperation between nation states has begun to fail as we, as we can see, as we could have seen earlier in, in European Union or Europe, uh, with Brexit uh, or with the, the recent conflict between uh, American President Donald Trump uh, and World Health Organization when Donald Trump said he will not support and he will cut the budget uh, which goes to uh, World Health Organization. But let me say, but this current uh, political, political topic is beyond my capacity and impossible to grasp from the perspective of, uh, of me as a graphic designer or a designer. And this finally brings me to the answer, why does national letters uh, look like this? Uh, at some point in the process, I told, my, told to myself that I would like to find a chapter in history or a story or narrative where typography or graphic design were important on the biggest level, on the level of states, on the level of uh, continent and so on. And in my graphic design practice, I use typography as an essential tool of communication. I always use typography as an element with certain history, and I always want to use the right typefaces for the specific context. That's why I usually use typefaces which have been used for decades, such as uh, Neuhaus Grotesk, uh, Times, Universe, Folio, and etc. Same approach was at the London studio OKRM, where I worked a few months last uh, year during my internship. Then I realized that the letter forms of Latin alphabet are really settled, outlined, and the options are very limited. And therefore I got a little bit tired of seeing still the same posters on the internet where designers used large sizes of typography to, to, to cover missing content. I mean, I completely understand it and I kind of like it. And sometimes I do it myself. Uh, and probably everyone uh, who is watching this, this, this talk or this Zoom presentation uh, knows the graphic design or typography history, even though you're not practicing in uh, practicing graphic design, which goes from the printing revolution, then a big time gap, then Art Nouveau, Bauhaus, Swiss style, 80s, and that's simply it. So uh, my instinctive move when working on the, on, the, on the book, on the content of the book, was to zoom out from the very well-known Latin alphabet. And I suddenly started to see that there exist many different typographic landscapes. And this, this term typographic landscape was first uh, coined in the text by Irina Stenescu. Uh, with its very own and unique history. And I naturally started to be curious how has been these typographic landscapes formed and what is narrative there. Uh, in the book, there is a uh, introduction of mine, like summarizing the, the history of, the, of our Latin alphabet landscape. So, so you can then compare our European or North American or, or I, don't, I don't know where you are watching this with other perspectives, which is quite interesting. And a German philosopher and linguist, uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt once proclaimed that 
the diversity of languages is not a diversity of signs and sounds, but the diversity of views on the world. So zooming out is therefore often the best tool for understanding our own landscape or understanding anything we want to, we want to grasp. Uh, there are four case studies in the book, which enriches the topic of nation letters and reads it from different perspectives. And of course, there are a few other nations or states, nation states with their own national script, especially in the South and East Asia. There are many, many writing systems which can be part of nation letters, but to cover the spectrum of this topic, uh, 4K studies were enough. Uh, one of the reasons is that I had to travel uh, to these countries and document these uh, typographic landscapes to find interesting stories behind uh, the national writing systems. And I will now switch to the presentation to show you uh, my research. All right, uh, here we go. And I know I promised we would leave the homogeneous world of Latin script, but before uh, before doing so, uh, we should definitely stop off in a country uh, where Latin script itself, uh, unlike anywhere else in the world, is um, maybe Vietnam is the only exception is perceived as a national symbol. And this case study is Turkey. The first case study will help us to understand how crucially written languages, uh, written language operate as a tool for the formation of nations and, and nation states. Uh, the subtitle of this chapter or case study uh, stands one small step for Atta, but one giant leap for Turk which is obviously paraphrasing uh, astronaut uh, Neil Armstrong. And it implies the enormous social cultural shock, almost unimaginable today, experienced by the Turkey 70 years, uh, 70 years ago. A uh, change in uh, writing system from Arabic to Latin alphabet. Ataturk's motives were as much political as they were linguistic. Uh, the attempt to separate the state from the influence of the church or religion, national unification, and in addition to other reforms, a clear movement towards the modern West and its values. To give you a full context, Turkey succeeded the ethnically heterogeneous Ottoman Empire, uh, the response to uh, unification was a need to deal with, deal with the minorities, which disrupted an impression of Turkey's ethnic and national homogeneity. This, of course, had tragic uh, consequences for the Kurdish and Armenian minorities living in the east of the country who were driven away or and killed. And the Greek minority on the, on the west coast. Um, another goal, uh, of course, was increasing the literacy of the population. One convincing argument for typographic reform was the difficulty in typesetting Arabic. Although Arabic is a phonemic language, the script is not based on individual signs, which could be arranged uh, easily for print. Rather, it's a cursive script. Uh, Arabic writing is highly uh, calligraphic with ligatures, which makes it difficult to kern and connect characters. And also individual letters change based on their position within a word. So one letter might need up to four variations. One initial, initial 
second medial, third final, and also isolated. Setting the script requires a great deal of inventiveness and is disproportionately expensive, more expensive to, to manipulate. So the invention of writing uh, of the printing press, uh, the Latin alphabet, so since the invention of the print, uh, printing press, the Latin alphabet had a considerable advantage over the, over the other script types. Setting a Turkish text for printing a Latin script needs hundreds of types medals fewer than a printer using an Arabic script, which is 29 signs in the Latin alphabet, but 482 in Arabic. Uh, the standard Latin alphabet was uh, complemented by seven further symbols, uh, which are precisely phonetic representations of uh, phonemes particular to Turkish. One of them, one of, them one of those is ch, sh, the Turkish Language Association, uh, called in Turkish uh, Türk Adil Kurumu, uh, presided over, the, over by Atatürk himself, also took great care to ensure that along with the typographical revolution, the language also rid itself of most of the terms uh, taken over from Persian, Arabic, and Greek, replacing them with neologism, neologism and surrogates. Neologism invented by Atatürk's language engineers could not replace deeply rooted words. As an argument to keep these words, uh, the obscure Austrian linguist Hermann uh, Theodor Gvergic uh, presented his sun language theory on the premise that uh, Turkish was the first language over ever to be created. According to this theory, uh, the very first word anyone uttered was ah. Uh, upon following at the at the sun, following this line of reasoning, all the all the words taken from Arabic and Persian were at the bottom Turkish. Uh, these are a selection. Uh, from from a uh, primers in a in the National Library of Turkey in Ankara, and where we uh, took uh, our our research, and it shows that between during 1928 and 1929, there were many uh, primers first in a uh, first. Uh, uh, in January 1928 was printed in Arabic and then in September 1929 they were all printed in a Latin script. One of the most fascinating aspects of the typographic reform uh, were marches to, pro to promote and celebrate this giant nation relief. Uh, streets were filled with posters presenting Latin alphabet to public. The poster on the on the left says, "The school of the nation will open on the day. Anyone between 16 and 40 who does not know the new alphabet is obliged to attend." Even neon light installation was used for the celebration, as we can see on the on the right. And also horses were included in the in these in these marches. This is a photo reportage uh, for National Geographic, uh, uh, written and shot by Minard Owen, Owen Williams, uh, like a foreign correspondent to National Geographic, and this was from streets uh, of Turkey in 1929 uh, as we can see on these on these images there are posters uh, 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 in the streets showing the new alphabet
And as we can see on the on the image on the left, also the shop shop windows were used to to promote the new alphabet because it was written in a, by Owen Williams that they uh, they were showing uh, products with which starts with the, the the letters in the shop windows. And I don't know which other state in modern history have done such transition and reform, which is at the same time well documented in photographs and texts. At the end of the new on their new curses, uh, citizens were given a diploma uh, showing that they could read and write in the new Turkish letters, as we can see on the image on the right. And the most striking aspect of the typographic uh, revolution is the speed with uh, which the change took place. For printed dailies, the transition to Latin script was set for a precise date in late November, seven months after the change was announced. During our visits to the archives of Ataturk's library in Istanbul, uh, we observed how the, the Jumhuriyet newspaper changed its writing system from one day to the next. As we can see on the left, there's a, there's a newspaper printed mostly, mainly uh, in Arabic letters. And it's from, it's from uh, 30 November, 1928. And on the right, completely in Latin alphabet, uh, it's from 1st December, so there's just uh, one, one day different and completely new uh, newspaper. Uh, these radical state reforms took place in the modernist period, so it is not surprising uh, that the construction of a new center of power, the new capital city of Ankara, was included among them to demonstrate the ambitions of the new republic. Uh, Ankara represented a tabula rasa on which a new Turkish order uh, could be constructed. Uh, moving the state headquarters uh, from the uh, to a medieval city from the time of the Hittites, located in the center of the Anatolian plain, was mostly strategic. Uh, strategic. Ataturk, with a long military career behind him, did not want to be attacked from the sea, which could easily happen in uh, Constantinople, which is uh, today uh, Istanbul. Uh, Ankara also allowed Ataturk to construct a unified national narrative uh, rising from the ancient roots of Anatolian culture. The, the layered port town, known variously as Istanbul, Constantinople, and Tsarigrad, couldn't offer such a consistent narrative. And our records of the typographic uh, landscape were centered in Ankara, uh, the seat of government and uh, president, president's office. Once a small city known mostly for breeding Ankara cats, it's, uh, it is, it's now the capital of Turkey with almost 5 million residents. And every building displays at least one flag, red with a sickle and star, and President Erdogan's speech is blasted out from every, every television. And one a uh, funny or interesting aspect was that the lack of the continual historical development of writing and its typographic tradition opened a linguistic cosmos before us, full of crude signs, including official state buildings. Uh, as we can see on the image on the middle uh, from the National Library of Turkey in Ankara, uh, which at first seems to come from the camera instant translation function 
in uh, Google Streets. So, and while a Turkish case uh, study demonstrates the ideological movement of uh, geographically Eastern country uh, towards the West, the second case study, Israel, uh, demonstrates how Western thought uh, on state building was geographically imported to a place with a different mentality and how ignoring these differences created problems which appear practically uh, irresolvable even today. Uh, we move to the Middle East, to the territory of present day Israel. In the story of Zionism and modern settlements in Palestine, uh, language and writing have their own chapter. Uh, unified language and writing system were absolute necessities for a building state at the turn of the 20th century. Although it seems today that Hebrew was always the clear choice, it was not the case. Hebrew is something of a modern linguistic miracle, a language conserved mainly in writing, chiefly in uh, religious texts, became born again as a spoken language and secular script. That's why the title for this chapter stands, a new language sweeps clean, but an old script knows the corners, uh, which is, uh, which was this, this uh, subtitle was designed by my friend, Jan Novak. And the previous Turkish one by my friend, uh, uh, my friend, Sepp McLaughlin. I didn't mention it before. Uh, the Theodor Herzl, uh, the founder of the Zionist movement, did not believe Hebrew could be the language of the future Jewish state. He was not interested in the romantic uh, renovation or resuscitation of Hebrew or the reincarnation of the historical Hebrew farmer like the Zionist of Eastern Europe. He believed the state's official language should be German, as he noted in his diary in uh, June uh, 1895. Let me quote him. I believe German will be the main language. This conclusion arises from our most widespread jargon, Judeo-German. Thus, we will rid ourselves of this language of the ghetto, so once the secret language of prisoners, our teachers, our teachers will realize this. In 19, uh, 1898, during his only, only visit to Palestine, he encountered uh, Elias Ben Yehuda, then a young linguist, but later a key, key figure in the revival of spoken Hebrew. He noted, I also met a fanatic who tried to convince me that our movement needs to adopt Hebrew as our nation language. This is, of course, laughable. The first Zionists were cosmopolitan people uh, with command of a number of languages. They all knew the benefits and simplicity of Latin script, but even so, they opted to keep the Hebrew abjad. As the British linguist Jeffrey Sampson noted, traditional Hebrew script could be described as a fairly clumsy system. Its adoption by the founders of a highly developed nation who were well acquainted with other scripts has to be explained with a view to emotional considerations relating to history and religion. In the linguistics of both spoken and written language, these rational factors play a much greater role than a practical use. Its heaviness and in the fact that written Hebrew was unchanged since the beginnings of the printing press in, in the 15th century, uh, led British uh, researcher of the New Testament 
uh, of the, uh, the Old Testament or Bible, uh, he, uh, J. Shenfield, to revise it following the example of love in script. He published his proposals in 1932 in a slim volume and specimen called the New Hebrew Typography. This was precisely four years after the publication of Jan Chichol's The New Typography, which offered new approaches, uh, new approaches to approaches uh, for working with Latin script. He suggests uh, changes including the creation of italics, uh, distinguishing lower and uppercase letters, creating series and reverse contrast of horizontal and vertical strokes. In essence, bringing Hebrew type as close to Latin script as possible. He argued that since there was a revival in the spoken form of the language, this should be also reflected in a change of a script. And let me call him again. It is true indeed that the Hebrew language has burst the bonds of the traditional script, uh, traditional spirit. It is not yet free. For Hebrew is still in bondage to the, to the letter those age-old characters in which sacred scrolls have been penned so patiently and exacted by generations of scribes still shackle it with their metallic counterparts, writes Shenfield in his specimen. Another attempt uh, at reformation of the written form of Hebrew was through the Latin script itself. Uh, one key supporter was the son of previously mentioned Eliezer ben Yehuda, the founder of modern Hebrew. Uh, his name was Itamar ben Avi, who published uh, a weekly called Deror, which means in English, Liberty, in the 1930s, written in Latin script. Although his endeavor was not successful, uh, ben Avi's system for the romanization of Hebrew is still used today on traffic signs throughout Israel. Uh, interesting fact is that Itamar ben Ali was also the first person uh, in over 2000 years for whom Hebrew was a mother tongue. It is also not without interest that ben Ali probably met Ataturk, uh, then still Mustafa Kemal twice in 1911 at the Kamenitz Hotel in Jerusalem, while Ben Avi's attempts uh, to romanize Hebrew were uh, unsuccessful, Ataturk succeeded in romanizing Turkish only a few years later. Uh, and it was Ben Avi, or as he claims in his autobiography, who gave the Turkish statements, uh, statement this idea. Just as it did for Turkish nationhood, uh, building cities and settlements play a key role. Uh, in both cases, we are dealing with a mix of pragmatism and modernist symbolism. The biggest city to become a manifesto for Zionism and modernity is Tel Aviv. Uh, this first modern Jewish city bordering the, the Arab city of Jaffa built on sand dunes on the coast of the Mediterranean from uh, 1909, is the Israeli state's central narrative. As we can see here on the image, uh, in 1909, a number of Jewish residents decided to move to a healthier environment outside the crowded city of Jaffa. They established a company called Ahuzat Bayit, and with the assistance of the Jewish National Fund, purchased 12 acres of sand dunes north of Jaffa. As the families could not decide on how to allocate the land, they held a lottery to ensure a fair division. Akiva Arie Weiss, 
chairman of the lottery committee, wrote the names of the participants on the white shells and the plot numbers on the gray shells. He paired them, assigning each family a plot, and thus uh, Tel Aviv's founding families began uh, building the first modern Hebrew city. Tel Aviv is also the, uh, is perhaps the only city in the world whose name came from a book, writes uh, Sharon Rothbard in her book, White City, Black City. It may not be coincidence that Tel Aviv was at first a book and, late, and only later a city. After all, Zionism's two main goals were the revival of the Hebrew language and the building of the land of Israel. In that respect, Tel Aviv, a full-size uh, realization of Herzl's oxymoron, stands as a living proof that books can erect buildings and establish cities. Cities are the material pillars of a nation and their streets layer. So there are national identity symbols onto them. Language, letters, typography, the typographic landscape. All right, the previous uh, two case studies showed how in the case of Turkey, uh, type was used as a political tool to incite a civilization leap and uh, change in the country's uh, geopolitical, uh, geopolitical orientation. In the case of Israel, writing and language worked as a social adhesive, which allowed arrivals uh, from various countries to feel a sense of togetherness in their new home. In this third case study of Georgia, writing worked as an ancient shield, thanks to which the Georgians maintained their statehood despite constant pressure and turbulence in the, in the region. That's all the reason why the subtitle of this chapter stands, Caucasian type now available in all families. It is a paraphrase of a commercial language of contemporary uh, type foundries. And this lettering was, uh, was drawn and designed by my friend Jan Horchiv. The Caucasus, a belt of land between the Black and Caspian Seas, is one of the most ethnically and linguistically atomized regions in the world. Historically, uh, uh, this territory is also very unstable, determined by the various affinities to the superpowers which demarcate the region. In the north, Russia, formerly the West uh, Soviet Union. In the south, Turkey, formerly the Ottoman Empire and Iran, uh, previously uh, formerly Persia. The headline for the story in the next paragraphs could be Soviet acrobat reader. It was the Soviet Union who meddled most intensely in systems of writing, perhaps of all the governments of the world. Legislative acrobatics were employed constantly as the politics of language and writing of various minority nations transformed until the entire trade ended in a decision which was political, politically convenient, convenient for uh, Moscow. The Bolshevik revolution, which ended the rule of the Tsarist monarchy in Russia, opened the doors for the emancipation of ethnic, uh, religious and linguistic minorities. During the, the revolution, these nations use this historical opportunity for nation self-determination uh, and establish their own states, later fluidly forming larger formations, similarly as in Central Europe, uh, Czechoslovakia. These states in the Caucasus and Central Asia usually had very short lifespans determined very soon after the consolidation of power at the center uh, in Moscow. 
examples of these states from between 1917 and 1922 include the North uh, Caucasus Emirate, the Mountain Republic of the North Caucasus, or the Kars Republic. Uh, during the first years of the Soviet Union, there was still a conviction that the Marxist revolution would spread throughout the entire world. Uh, when Leo Trotsky was still in power, he predicted that Western Europe with its Latin script would become the center of the new Marxist state. After the death of Lenin, who enforced the Romanization of peripheral territories, the Georgian uh, Joseph Stalin, originally a commissioner for national issues, seized power. Uh, then the global situation changed considerably and not in, in the Soviet Union's favor. Uh, the Marxist revolution did not spread west and diplomatic isolation forced Stalin to completely change his strategy, including Moscow to what we call, what we call one country socialism. As World War II grew closer, Stalin turned to nationalism the only movement capable of mobilizing such an enormous territory in case of a war. Hence, Soviet linguistic engineers began to reinstate Cyrillic, casting aside the new Latin script. The second, no less important reason for this step was the recent establishment of Latin script in Ataturk's Turkey in 19. 28. Stalin was afraid the Turkish nations of the Soviet Union might grow closer to strong unified Turkey, uh, writes Professor Nicholas uh, Ostler. So in a nutshell, at first, the Soviet Union feared alliances between Arab riding peripheral, uh, peripheral areas with Arab riding Turkey which is why it introduced Latin script. A few years later, Moscow feared Turkey, newly writing in Latin script, and so it introduced Cyrillics. Uh, March 1938 saw a decree which uh, prescribed the teaching of Russian at all elementary schools and to write all mother tongues in a Cyrillics. Moscow argued that it would be easier for the students to learn a single script. The process of Russification uh, reached its conclusion at the end of the war and Cyrillic became the standard script in the entire Soviet Union, except the Baltic states, Armenia and Georgia, where there were other alphabets were too firmly ingrained to be easily uh, replaced. These last two, are Armenia and Georgia, are unique examples of small states with a national writing system of their own. Of the 15 countries that formed the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, Armenia and Georgia provide, proved the most resistant uh, to Russification. While for most of the ethnicities of the Caucasus, type was a 20th century invention, Armenian and Georgian already had their own alphabet established following the example of Greek and dating back to the fifth century. Uh, the first written record of this alphabet, whose author and precise date of creation remain unknown, came from the year uh, 330, especially an inscription in a church in present day Palestine. This inscription, however, has nothing in common with the contemporary form of the civic Georgian alphabet known as Mkhedruli. Uh, this inscription was written in type called Asantabruli, or capital letter. When we speak uh, of the Georgian alphabet, we mean, we mean three different forms of writing. 
Asom Tavruli, Nushkuri, and Khedrul. The first two are used only rarely by the Georgian Orthodox Church. Khedrulli, as I mentioned, is the official script of Georgia. It is written from the left to right and is composed of 33 characters. Um, Khedrulli indicates stress, but it uses no diacritical marks or capital letters. An interesting fact of the Georgian language and its writing is that it does not distinguish genders and it also uh, and is also read, read exactly uh, as it is written, which think of uh, English or French is certainly uh, not a matter of course. In uh, 2015, UNESCO even added Georgian scripts, Asom Tabrili Nushkuri and Khedrili to the intangible um, cultural heritage list. The creation of these unique national writing systems is closely tied to the national churches. At the beginning of the fourth century AD, the kingdom of Armenia became the first nation to adopt Christianity as its official religion. Uh, Georgian Orthodox Church became the official Church of Georgia shortly after. The failure of reciprocation in these two countries can thus mostly be attributed to historically deeply rooted religion and culture, mediated through a unique writing system. Jewish Russian poet Osip Mandelstam once very nicely said of Georgian culture. I would consider Georgian culture a type of ornamental culture, tracing the outlines of the vast and fully developed territory of the foreign culture. They, meaning the Georgians, mainly absorb only its outer design, while at the same time fiercely resisting the intently hostile essence of the powerful neighboring territories. The presence of ornament in the Georgian alphabet is undisputed. The entire expressive character of the alphabet is based on distinctive arches above, above or below the baseline. This character allows for highly visual and expressive work uh, but with the script as tested to be uh, to, uh, to by a number of graphic works and book covers from the modernist and futurist periods. At the beginning of the 20th century, the entire world was obsessed with desire for progress, for, for destruction of the old and uh, for renewal. These tendencies were reflected in art and culture as indivisible components of the life of society. The creation of independent Georgian Republic based in Tbilisi attracted artists and whole groups of the Russian avant-garde from Moscow. One of the movements to pump through the city was Futurism, a path that rejected aged approaches and which wanted to establish a new language of art. Futurist books from 1920s became one of the crucial events in the cultural scene of the Georgian metropolis. And we can see now one of the Friedrich's group, uh, Almanacs, the poems. During our visit to Tbilisi, which became the center of our explorations of the Georgian typographic landscape, we noticed in addition to bizarre signs saying 24, 24 to emphasize that the opening hours truly all hours are, are, are all hours and ubiquitous uh, science advertising xerox book and translation we noticed one important element that fascinated us throughout the trip since 2013 it has become compulsory 
into the capital city to display all shop signs for international companies in Georgian script as well as the original. Walking through the streets, you can thus observe Georgian mutations of H&M, McDonald's, KFC, Under Armour, Puma, Akita, and etc. The intimately familiar epigraphic of these global brands through simple substitution of the shapes we know so well, feels like a surreal alternate reality somewhere in the Caucasus, Caucasus mountains. But what you, are, what you will barely see, however, are signs in the Cyrillic script. Although Georgia was indelibly, indelibly a part of the Soviet Union, the Union could never suppress the historic relationship of the Georgians to their writing systems, writing system. Especially not here at the very heart of the Georgian nation. Animosity towards Russia was only heightened during the war uh, for South Ossetia in 2008. And type is thus a symbolic, intentional and organic demonstration of control over one's own territory and the vi viability of Georgia's national type and its typographic landscape. And in the last case study, we moved even further away from Central Europe. Uh, while Georgia is considered the place where civilization first tested wine, inland Ethiopia is where people first roasted and drank coffee. The name comes from a province in West Ethiopia, Kaffa. According to, to legend, the mountain shepherds noticed that after eating the orange berries from the omnipresent bushes, their goats were considerably more active than before. They tried roasting them, grinding them and mixing them in water, and they created coffee, one of the modern Ethiopia's most important exports. Ethiopia, located in the, in the Horn of Africa and one of the largest African countries, is interesting in that almost everything is considered national or uh, civilizational. From the plant known as teff, a local gluten-free grain, which is the foundation of Ethiopian cuisine, uh, fruit cut, the local chewing drug, which has uh, similar effects to the coca leaf in uh, Latin America, and which the local use among uh, other things to counteract the adverse effects of the extremely high altitude in the capital uh, Addis Ababa, to the absence of surnames and their own orthodox Julian calendar, which is seven years behind uh, our Georgian calendar and unique system of time measurement in which the new day begins at six in the morning. But what qualifies Ethiopia to become one of our case studies is, is the fact that it is the only African country to use its own national and indigenous script until this day. It is also one of the two African states on the, con on the continent never to be colonized by a European superpower. Of course, except a short episode between uh, 1935 and 1941 when Ethiopia was attacked and occupied by fascist Italy, and after which the Emperor Haile Selassie was forced to leave to exile in Palestine and Great Britain. I felt compelled to explore how these two facts, national script and never, uh, never colonized, are connected. 
similarly, in comparison to Israel and Georgia, Ethiopia uses a character system whose development and standardization is closely linked with religion. In Ethiopia, this is the very influential Orthodox Church known as Tuwayedu, founded in the 4th century AD. The first written records using Ethiopian type, however, are from the 5th century before Christ. The liturgical script from those times is still used in the church today, church, uh, church today known as Ge'es. The modern Ethiopian official language, Amharic, is recorded today using a reformed script, Fidel, which means literally writing systems, uh, writing system. This is the central administrative script used by all bureaus and schools. It is written from left to right and belongs among the syllabic science systems, Abugida. The characters are graphemes representing syllables. Consonants and the vowel e uh, define the 33 basic characters, which are then slightly modified by short complementary strokes, flags, depending on the uh, appended vowels. The whole character set, known as Fidel Gebeta, is composed of 299 characters. Even in the digital era, the form of the graphemes has preserved a certain ancient and calligraphic look. When in Addis Ababa, trying to find out anything you can, uh, you can about local typography, you won't get far. Everything connected to Fidel is referred to as calligraphy. Even though Ethiopia is a multi-ethnic state in which uh, around 80 lang eight languages are spoken belonging to uh, three families, Semitic, Cushitic and Nilo Saharan, Amharic is the dominant nation language. This is paradoxical because the Amharic people forms only 23% of the population. The largest ethnic group is the Oromo, uh, 34%. The Oromo people, however, has never participated in the rule of a state. The current Prime Minister, Abiy Ahmed, uh, on the left, elected in 2018, is the very first Prime Minister in the history of the country to become from the Oromo. Historically, the Oromo language was written using both Fidel and Latin script. This was true until the 1970s, when Mengistu's brutal dictatorship uh, prohibited the use of written Oromo completely. In 1991, the opposition movement uh, Oromo Liberation Front, OLF, decided what, that Oromo would be uh, transcribed using a version of Latin script known as QB, as they consider Amharic an imperial language. The only official language and lingua franca of Ethiopia, however, remains Amharic, written in uh, Fidel. Just as in the previous case studies, the capital city, Addis Ababa, is a center of power and wealth from which power is then bureaucratically distributed out to the peripheral, uh, peripheral regions. Here we can see the, the beautiful photo of Addis Ababa from 1897 with a royal palace situated on the top of the hill. In the case of Ethiopia, we cannot speak of a perfect nation state. The tribally administrated southern regions can hardly be described as entirely integrated components of the state. The same could be said of the Somali region in the east of the country, where control over the territory is still not assured uh, 
as there is a sizable Muslim minority. In many respects, Ethiopia's linguistics are reminiscent of um, China's, where someone from the west of the country cannot communicate with someone from the east. Only a common administrative writing system establishes a shared platform connecting diverse regions into a single state. Another connection between Ethiopia and China or Thailand and Japan is the tradition of receiving empires and their pro projection of themselves as entire civilizations rather than states as such. I don't mention China by chance. In recent years, we have observed the materialization of enormous Chinese investment in Ethiopian infrastructure. The monumental Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam on the Nile River, roads, connections to the East Coast in Djibouti, a newly open uh, light rail system, and entire districts of high-rise buildings in the south of Addis Ababa mark the great interest that China has in the region. After his election in 2018, Abiy Ahmed, the newly elected uh, reformist prime minister, fully opened up the country towards the east. Ethiopia has a fast growing economy and some Western media already consider Ethiopia both positively and negatively as China's China or the China of Africa. Now let me summarize the last, this last case study with a few paragraphs uh, from the essay by uh, Professor Ibati Budil, Budil, published in uh, uh, Nation Letters. Room for Ethiopia to move up in the inter international political and economic order was extremely limited. For instance, pre-major Japan was predisposed to rapid modernization by high levels of urbanization, literacy, homegrown mercantilism, relative peace internally, efficient and centralized government, and the ethnic and cultural homogeneity, which simplified the processes. Traditional Ethiopia lacked all these attributes. The survival of Fidel, despite its additional economic costs, may be taken as one of the signs of Afro-modernity, as coined by an American political scientist, Michael Hunchar, as the selective incorporation of technologies, discourses, and institutions of the modern West within the cultural and political practices of African derived peoples. Ethiopia's Abyssinian culture, cultural and political history also played a significant role in the construction and advancement of Afro-modernity. The center of the world localized in Western Europe and North America and characterized by the use of the Latin alphabet exercised a symbolic power over the periphery, including Asia, Africa, and South America. However, this, beth <coughs> excuse me. However, this Western symbolic power was not strong enough to eliminate traditional symbolic symbols of local identity from the marginal regions of the world system. This allowed the retention of alternative writing systems, despite a general acceptance of the idea of Western modernity in states such as Russia, China, Japan, the Arabic countries, Myanmar, Thailand, and Ethiopia. All right. So there was there was all. And if you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to write me uh, to 
uh, direct messages on my Instagram profile. Uh, be better to, to use this letterbox profile. Or you can use also my personal uh, profile, Marek Radilka. And hope you uh, enjoy it. And hope I hope this presentation or talk has opened you your views and you will be even more curious um, uh, about the world. So thank you very much. Thanks again, uh, Printed Meta team. Thanks, Anna Collins. Thanks, Eugene Chang. And see you in the future with other projects. Thanks.